Good afternoon. Just making sure uh, that you're still awake, although after that singing, I'm sure you are awake, and I'm sure the angels are rejoicing to hear such glorious worship ascend from this place unto our great God. Uh, one question I do have, Julie, are you planning to sing one song after I conclude? Yeah. One? Okay. Just trying to a lot for the proper amount of time. I, I think the way I want to begin this afternoon is by having you take your Bibles and turn to the gospel according to Luke chapter 12, from which we'll be reading verses 16 through 21. As you find that reference in your scriptures, I just want to remind you of the theme passage for this week uh, from Matthew 16 and show a little bit of the structural outline that Reverend Contreras and myself have been working with. Uh, you perhaps, although it seems quite some time ago, will remember that Monday evening, Reverend Contreras dealt with verse 24 of Matthew 16. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. A Tuesday morning, I dealt with verse 25, where Jesus says, for whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Yesterday, uh, Reverend Contreras uh, dealt with uh, the section that deals with self-denial in verse 24. Let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. So it falls to me today to address what is mentioned in verse 26. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? And then with eager anticipation, we look forward to Reverend Contreras uh, dealing with uh, the final verse 27 tomorrow, for the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels. I wanted to read, though, for a bit of context from the Gospel according to Luke chapter 12, beginning at verse 16 through 21. We read there as follows, Then he, that is Jesus, spoke a parable to them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, since I have no room to store my crops? So he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there I will store all my crops and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then whose will those things be which you have provided? So is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. If you turn back to the gospel according to Matthew, verse 16, uh, the verse that is before us is verse 26. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? In preparation over the past few months, but also especially the past few days, even this morning in my final preparations for my address that I'm now giving to you, I must have read this verse over 100 times. And I can tell you that the more you read it, the harder it hits, the more solemn it becomes. It's one of those questions that stops all conversation. It's one of those questions which confronts you with an inescapable seriousness. What does it profit a man? And of course there, including also a woman, what does it profit such a person if they gain the whole world and lose their own soul? My wife can testify that I've debated quite a bit on how to begin my address this afternoon. And I decided this morning as I got to the breakfast area early, as I sat by a table, I decided to tell you about three people. 
The first is Brian. Brian's in his mid-30s, born to a Christian family, raised in the Reformed faith, baptized as an infant. Growing up, he didn't miss a Sunday service, both the morning and the evening. His parents weren't perfect, but they were godly. Brian went to catechism class. Brian had the privilege of attending Christian schooling all throughout the early years and the high school years. Brian excelled in academic excellence, so much so that he obtained a full-ride scholarship to a very elite university. And yet Brian always had lingering questions in his mind concerning the Christian faith. The questions that he asked weren't asked out of a humble desire to learn, but more out of an arrogant desire to debate. In the elite secular university, Brian found his skepticism supported by his secular professors. Brian became convinced of the theory of evolution, and he proclaimed himself to be an agnostic. That is one who is sure that you can have no real sure faith or knowledge about God. It has been over 20 years since Brian has stepped foot in a Christian church. The second individual is Sally. She's in her late 20s. She's been blessed with stunning good looks and an outgoing personality. Those two combined to make her the life of the party all throughout high school and all throughout college, and there were many, many parties in her life. Always a bit boy crazy, she started dating the football quarterback within her senior year at college, even though he had no interest in the Christian faith. Her parents were also godly parents. Sally also had been raised in the church, and although she knew better, and although her parents objected, her and her boyfriend moved in together their senior year of college. That was six years ago. And although there's been no wedding and there is no marriage, Sally and her boyfriend still live and party together. In the past five years, Sally has been to church once for the funeral of her grandmother. The third person I want to introduce you to is David. Uh, David is in his early 30s. He also had the distinct privilege of being born within the realm of the covenant of grace. He also received the waters of baptism from an early age. And while he and his family were faithful in the means of grace in their local church in David's earlier years. Uh, during his later high school years, he began to travel more and more because he showed a bit of promise in the skill of basketball. The travel team that he was part of took him away on many a weekend, either traveling or playing in tournaments, and so his attendance at church and underneath the means of grace became less and less regular. He always dreamed of going pro, but his first season or two at a Division I college confronted him with the reality that his skill sets were not what he had imagined them to be. After a few relationships ended sourly, and after a few failed business ventures after college, he moved back into the basement of his mother's house, where he spends the majority of his time and money engaged in online sports gambling. It also has been quite a number of years since he has been to church. And so Brian, Sally, and David, although certain fictional elements have been woven into these stories, they represent 
a story that is told over and over and over again of individuals who don't answer the question of verse 26 with the right answer. What will it profit a man or a woman if he or she gains the whole world and loses his own soul? What what will a man give in exchange for his soul? I would submit to you this afternoon that this is a most earnest question. A most earnest question, but we want to ask ourselves, why, why does Jesus ask this question? Why does Jesus confront his disciples and confront his hearers, his listeners, his readers? Why, and in a very real way, through the word of God, why does Jesus come to, to me on this Thursday afternoon and say, Greg Lubbers, what will it profit a man? If he gain the whole world and lose his soul, why does Jesus come to you on a Thursday afternoon and say, what would you give in exchange for your soul? I would submit to you that part of the reason why Jesus asked this question is to give us a ground for a call to radical discipleship. You'll notice the very first word of verse 26 is for. It indicates that this is a ground, this is a reason, this is a support for the action that Jesus has called us to in the preceding verses. And if you just scan back, you'll notice that Jesus has called us to radical discipleship. He's used such words as deny, take up his cross, lose his life. Now be honest, if someone were to come to you and say, I have a proposition for you, it's going to involve self-denial, it's going to involve a cross, and it's going to involve losing your life. What would your first instinctive answer to that proposition be? Mine would be no thanks. What you've described Denying myself, taking up a cross, and losing my life doesn't really sound like something that I really want to do. And so Jesus comes with this ground to encourage us in this action of radical discipleship, but also because of how few there are who faithfully participate in this radical discipleship. On one hand, if you follow the earthly ministry of Jesus Christ as is accounted in the narratives of the gospel, on one hand, Jesus was, was quite popular. Now, I certainly know it's true what he said, uh, that foxes have their holes and the birds of the air had their nests, but the Son of Man had nowhere to lay his head. But, but Jesus did amass at times quite a following. Quite a few people were interested in what they had to hear from him. And yet John 6, verse 66 recounts this. From that time, many of his disciples went back. They went away. They left. And then these words are written, and walked with him no more. Many of his disciples left and walked with him no more. You can think also in the life of the Apostle Paul of one individual named Demas in 2 Timothy 4 verse 10. It's written, Demas has forsaken me. And why did Demas forsake Paul? Paul tells us he loved this present world. And so this question is asked as a ground for radical discipleship, but also as a, a jolt to get us to do the math, and evaluate the prophet. Because while the call to be a follower of Christ is radical indeed, and while there are many, many individuals uh, who perhaps make a beginning but then fall away, our culture and our world also comes, and it has a message that bombards our ears, and that message is don't deny yourself anything. 
Our culture is characterized by secularism. Whatever is spiritual can just simply be ignored or at least compartmentalized. Oh, okay, okay, our culture says, you want to have a little faith, you want to have a little Christianity, that's fine. Just, just confine it to one small little area of your own personal private life. Certainly don't let your faith get in the way of hedonistic pursuit of, of gratifying your own sensual desires. Because our world will encourage us to never say no to whatever our appetites may be. And Jesus knows this. And so he comes and he says, what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world but loses his own soul? Now, of course, you know this is a rhetorical question. I mean, you, you look in verse 26, and the, and the answer isn't spelled out. And yet the answer cries out. What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. And what... Will a man give an exchange for his soul? What would you trade for the very soul that you have been given? This is the answer. And the reason the answer is nothing is because of the vanity of the world. Now, a couple of words in that statement that need to be defined World is used in a variety of different ways within the Bible. You know, sometimes the world describes the created order that would include the trees and etc. Sometimes the world describes the, the fallen mass of humanity. Uh, but in this context, to borrow our definition, uh, the world here represents the whole circle of earthly goods. All of its riches, ad advantages, pleasures. Everything uh, that the culture can provide you, everything that a lifestyle can provide you. If you took all of the potential that was within creation and if you harnessed it all and set it at your feet, that's what Jesus is saying. Even if you were to able to, to gain all of that, what would it profit? Now, many of these things within the world are not evil in and of themselves. Money is not evil in and of itself. Of course, the love of money, the, the inordinate love of money, is the root of all kinds of evil. Is it, is it sinful? Is it, is it wrong in and of itself to, to have a, a great abundance of material possessions? And the answer has to be no, because we note that, of course, there was Abraham, and, and there was Job, and, and there was David and Solomon. Now, these individuals uh, had great fortunes of material possessions. Is, is it wrong to have a, a certain gift in, in an area of perhaps study, or, or a gift in an area in athletics? Certainly not. I'm always remarkably struck uh, by David's valiant warriors and, and what they were able to do as the Spirit of the Lord rested upon them and gave them this seemingly unnatural almost ability to perform heroic feats in the midst of battle. So it's not that the scriptures are coming in and saying all of these things are wrong in and of themselves. It's not wrong to, to work hard and, and to gain a certain measure of success in the workforce. It's not wrong to, to have a certain status of popularity if that status is gained for a noble reason, for a legitimate reason. Jesus isn't saying these things are wrong in and of themselves. What he is saying, if you're going to make this, any one of these, if you're going to make that 
what you're following in life. If you're walking in such a way as say, I just simply want to get rich. I just simply want to become popular. I just simply want to excel in this area of my life so that I can get all of the accolades of fame and popularity, so I can hear the claps of humanity. Jesus comes and says, wait a minute. Have you considered what the profit of that will ultimately be? Because it's all vanity. What does the word vanity as used in Ecclesiastes mean? It does not mean meaningless, but rather it means fleeting, something that quickly goes away. Everything in this present world is fleeting. You can have beauty, but what does Proverbs say? Charm is deceitful, and beauty fleets. You can have money, but I have yet to ever see a rich man take a single cent across the divide of time and eternity. You can have popularity, but I have yet in all of my study of world history seen an individual whose popularity peaked and then stayed at that peak indefinitely. Popularity peaks, and just as it peaks, it begins to fall. So Jesus says, what will it profit you if you follow after all of these things in and of themselves? Because far too often we live with a dangerous temptation to focus on the temporal to the neglect of the eternal. And I'm certainly not saying that this is only true of of teenagers. It's true for human beings. Far too often we live with a hyper focus on the temporal and we neglect the reality of the eternal. But it is the eternal that puts the temporal into perspective. It's the eternal that gives the temporal significance. It's the eternal that identifies the way forward in the temporal. And we only do right if we recognize the reality of the eternal. All of us at some point, and I, and I, don't, I don't mean to sound trite or, or light about this, but all of us at some point have to check out. And I don't mean just start daydreaming because of the fatigue and the boredom of a speaker. I mean all of our lives will have a day in which it is our last day in the temporal. Every single one of us has an appointment that cannot be changed, that cannot be rescheduled, that cannot be postponed. And that appointment is when the days of our lives are completed and we enter into the eternal and we stand before God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And it's only from that perspective that real profit can be evaluated. And so there are lessons from this verse. Read it with me again. What profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? First of all, the lesson is a lesson on the allurement of the world. I don't know if you've read it. If you haven't read it, I would encourage you to read it. I know it's quite antiquated, but John Bunyan's Pilgrim Progress, I would encourage you to read it. Now, there is a chapter entitled Vanity Fair, And in Vanity Fair, Pilgrim comes to the world. 
Uh, and John Bunyan goes on with his literary giftedness, and he describes certain, certain trinkets, we'll call them, uh, that Vanity Fair has to offer you. Uh, and some of them are just plain immoral, and we don't have to be overly graphic. We're all wise enough to know that there are certain immoral trinkets that this world parades before your eyes and ears and says, buy, 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 consume, consume, consume. Others of the trinkets within Vanity Fair are not immoral in and of themselves, but they're just distracting. Pilgrim's on, on a journey. He's on a journey to the celestial city. And some of the trinkets and, and some of the, the beckonings and some of the encouragements in Vanity Fair uh, are only designed to delay the, the process of Christian's onward journey. And, and you and I, we, we, we also live in the midst of Vanity Fair. So the world comes and says, you know what you need? You need to be popular. You know what you need? You need a certain measure of, of fame. You know what you need, the world says? You need, you need an attractive appearance. You need money. You need success. You need cars and you need the right kind of cars and you need houses and you need the right kinds of houses you need vacation spots and and you need this and you need that and I want to say to you this afternoon as teenagers because ultimately I'm not addressing the white lanyards teenagers I get it because there's a danger that a middle-aged bald guy stands up here and says, I don't know what's going on with the teenagers today. They seem distracted by everything the world has to offer. I get it. On one hand, the world has a lot to offer. A lot of glitz. A lot of glamour. A lot of stuff that looks nice. A lot of stuff that affords instant gratification. I get it. Maybe with one exception, I don't get the concern to have social followers. In, in my era, if you had a follower, you were in trouble. You looked behind you and you used the buddy system to avoid followers. So other than social followers, I have no idea how many friends I have on Facebook and I think that's the only social media, but I'm not being pharisaical here. I'm not speaking of my own righteousness. I get the allurement of the world. And that's why I wanna plead with you as I plead with myself, don't forget to do the math. Have you ever gone shopping either in person or online. I'll use Amazon as an example. Have you ever gone shopping for a while on Amazon? It's so easy, isn't it? At least I'm told it's easy. Sometimes I struggle with it. You, you, you search for an item. There's things on there that I didn't even know they made. Sometimes I'll talk to my wife, I'll say, you know what we really need? Something to do, kind of do this and that. Recently, our dryer plugged, you know, our dryer at our house dries your clothes. You teenagers are aware these things do exist. Your mom works magic in the laundry room with washers and dryers. Our dryer was plugged. The dryer vent was plugged. And so we called a technician, and he had a big, long thing with a brush on the end of it. He put it in there, pulled a bunch of lint out. I, I said, we need one of those. Probably not more than five minutes later, guess what was in our Amazon cart? One of these little brushes to get the lint out of your dryer tube. But have you ever done this? You, you've, you've shopped for a while. 
You've clicked on a few items. You go, oh, that'd be nice, that'd be nice, that'd be nice. And then all of a sudden you go to your cart and you look at the total and it's $374.92. You go, how did that happen? I just clicked on a few items. It was so easy, so convenient. And when I saw the item, I just had to have it. But then you get to the total cost, and you're a bit taken aback. See, that's the way some people live their lives. They go, oh, I want a little bit of this in life, and I want a little bit of that in life. This looks nice. That will make me happy. This will satisfy my senses. And they go throughout the entirety of their lives, filling up their carts with different sensual pleasures. And then comes eternity. And Jesus wants us to be aware before that day comes. What will it profit a man? If he gains the whole world, if you have everything in your cart, but you lose your soul. How does a person lose their soul? First of all, briefly, without going too deep in the theology, what is our soul? I hope that you learn in catechism class that we as human beings have both a body, our material element of our existence, and we have a soul, the immaterial element of our existence. And at our conception, our body and our soul come together, and that's our one person. And our, and our soul, well, immaterial, is the very center essence of who we are. And when the days of our temporal life are exhausted, and physical death has its final, so to speak, last act, our body will be discarded momentarily and our soul will continue to exist in a conscious state in the immediate presence of God until the great day of the resurrection when our soul will be reunited with our glorified bodies as Christians to live forever with our God. That's our soul. How does a person lose their soul. Well, at its most simplest answer, a person loses their soul by refusing to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. But a bit more explanation, a person can lose their soul by refusing to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ through indifference, through distraction, through procrastination. Think back with me just for a moment. How did Brian lose his soul? You remember Brian? He lost his soul in many ways because he believed that he was wiser than God. How did Sally lose her soul? Well, Sally lost her soul because she believed that the life of the party was true life. And David, well, David simply served the idol of his own imagined sports popularity until he saw it vanish before his eyes. But what about Brian, Sally, and David, in many ways, if you remember their ages, in their 30s, and their 20s, in many ways, we can't say for sure whether they've lost their souls. Remember another parable that our Lord Jesus Christ told us, a parable which we often call the prodigal son. And I know the main point of the parable of the prodigal son is not on the prodigal son. It's actually on the elder brother. But that's another topic for another time. But you remember what it says about the prodigal son? He wasted his life with riotous living. But is that the end of the story? 
Thanks be to God, it's not. Because he came to his senses. And what did he do when he came to his senses? He said, I will go back to my father's house. And what type of reception did he receive at his father's house? He had wasted half of his father's fortune. He had rebelled. He had run away. He had brought embarrassment, shame upon the family name. And it's a beautiful picture because where is the father? The father, you might say, is on the end of the driveway, scanning, looking. And he sees his son afar off. And he receives him with joy and with gladness. And so if there is a prodigal son here today, Come home. Come home to the loving arms of a gracious father who I assure you will receive you with love. And some of you, some of you know a prodigal, perhaps a family member, perhaps a sibling. Keep praying that they would come to their senses and that they would return home as well. But the main emphasis that I want to leave you with this afternoon as we begin to draw to a conclusion, and my own kids know that when I say we begin to draw to a conclusion, we probably have about five to seven minutes left. So don't get too excited yet. We're beginning to draw to a conclusion. The main emphasis I want to leave you with is do the math. Do the math. There are a lot of things to enjoy in life, things that our Father has given us to enjoy. Enjoy them. But enjoy them in their proper perspective. And don't ever, ever let your pursuit of things to enjoy in this life endanger your soul. Don't ever trade your soul for anything that is only lasting a brief, brief, brief moment. I said that we'd close, and we will close, I want to close with a story of probably one of my greatest heroes in the athletic era. Maybe some of you think we're going to about talk about LeBron James or Michael Jordan, or maybe some of you think, well, he, as old as he is, maybe he'll talk about the 1984 Detroit Tigers and how they went season winning onto the World Series. I want to go even further back to the year 1924. To a man named Eric Little. Some of you may know him, may have heard of him. If you hadn't, after you're done with Pilgrim's Progress, read Chariots of Fire, biography on Eric Little. The first thing I love about Eric Little, and he was an athlete, he was a track star. First thing I love about Eric Little is how he answered his older sister. Both of them would end up going to the mission field His older sister was a bit more serious, more spiritually inclined in Eric's youth. And as Eric was running, as he was pursuing his dream of of being a track and field star, Eric's sister said to him, Eric, you shouldn't be doing that. You should give yourself to the mission field earlier. You should give yourself to the cause of Christ. And, And Eric's response, I think, is just legendary. He said to his sister, God made me fast. And when I run, I can sense his pleasure. God made some of you fast. God made some of you with the ability to jump. 
God gave some of you the ability to sing, and oh, how I covet your gift. My wife also wishes I had your gift. (laughs) Some of you can do mathematical problems that I can't even begin to decipher. Do it to the best of your ability, knowing God is pleased when you use those gifts for his glory, to sense his pleasure. Eric Little had the opportunity to qualify for the 1924 Olympics in the 100 meter race. But Eric Little was also a committed Christian with a strong adherence to the Sabbath day. And as he made his way to the 1924 Olympics, he found out to his dismay that the 100 meter was scheduled on a Sunday. The event he excelled in, the event he had trained in, the event he had qualified in, the event that he was hoping to gold medal in was scheduled to be run on a Sunday. And Eric Little, as a man of conviction, said, I won't do it. And he had enormous pressure from the Olympic Committee And he had enormous pressure from his home country, the United Kingdom. But he said, I will not do it. So he did what any Olympian would do, and he registered for the 400 meter. I say that with jest because although both are short distances, anyone who runs track knows that there's a world of difference between running the 100 meter in the Olympics and running the 400 meter in the Olympics. Eric Little said, I'll run the 400 meters. And he ran. And he broke a world record. And he won the gold medal. And I just have to put in there, they asked him afterwards, how'd you break the gold, how'd you break the world record? How'd you win the gold medal? And, and he said, you know what I do when I run the 400? I run the 200 meters that come first as fast as I can. And then I run the second 200 even faster. So if you're in a 400 meter, run the first 200 fast as you can and then pick up the speed. Your coach will probably tell you differently, but say Eric Little tried it and it worked. (laughs) But he has this quote. I want to give credit to my wife because she actually gave me this quote just a few days ago. Eric Little said, Many of us are missing something in life because we are going after that which is second best. I want to read that part again. Many of us are missing something in life because we are going after that which is second best. He continues, I put before you what I have found to be the best, one who is worthy of all of our devotion, Jesus Christ. He is a savior for the young and the old, and he, and only he, is the one who can bring out the best that is in us. And then he closed with these words, Lord, here I am. I want to kind of duplicate what I said on Tuesday with John Calvin's prayer, Lord, I offer my heart promptly and sincerely. Eric Little imitated something of that before he headed off to the mission field. He said, Lord, here I am. And I would encourage you and I encourage myself to say the same thing. Lord, here we are signing up for radical discipleship. Here we are, followers of you, because we know the answer to the question, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? And we know the answer is nothing. And we know that it profits a man everything If he follows after the Lord Jesus Christ, let's pray. 
Our Heavenly Father, we call upon your name in prayer as we have spoken about these words this afternoon. We thank you, Lord, that you speak truth into our lives, especially into our lives that are so often confronted with the messages of this world and also of the allurements of this world. Uh, Lord, we sense our own tendency uh, to be attracted to that which the world has to offer. And so we pray that you would refocus our hearts, our minds, our wills, and our affections upon following the Lord Jesus Christ and give us the resolve within our heart also to say those words spoken by Eric Little, here we are. Here we are as followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, as those who know you, as those who love you, as those who find great joy and delight in you. We pray this for Jesus' sake. Amen.